Okay. Um, thanks. Um, thanks for having me. Um, as you saw, this is a great paper. Um, let me, I remember John Campbell gave a discussion at the NBER a long time ago, and he prefaced this by saying that, uh, you know, he viewed his job as a discussant as kind of being like a, uh, somebody who tests children's toys. And, you know, you've got this beautiful toy, but your job as a toy tester is to throw it against the wall, to bite into it, and to see where it breaks, okay? So this is what I'm gonna do here. So this doesn't mean this isn't a fantastic toy, okay? Um, there's some really cool stuff here, and what I wanna do is see if we can figure out uh, where there are any weaknesses. Boy, these slides, I hope these aren't too hard to read. Okay, so the, uh, the key idea here is trying to, you know, the, the question that we've been obsessed with for decades in this field, what explains the cross-section of equity returns? Um, this is introducing a really cool new technique, uh, instrumented principal components analysis, okay? And um, it does solve a lot of the problems associated with, um, with some of the tests that have been run. And I wanna see, you know, to what extent are the author's claims, you know, naturally they're very, very strong. And I think some of that is merited, but not all of it. And that's gonna be the gist of my discussion. Um, Brian already talked a little bit about the history of this. Let me just say a few words on this. Um, it, it, just because I think it helps give some context to where this model fits. You know, as, as everybody's well aware, the initial model that really drove the development of finance was probably the CAPM. And the initial CAPM results were good, but there were some problems with the CAPM. It's an equilibrium model. You know, Roll pointed out the unobservability of the market portfolio. And, you know, kind of at the same time, Steve Ross, who we're dedicating this conference to, developed the seminal APT paper, okay? Where he said, well, look, you know, it, it, you can always break down the structure of asset returns on the basis of some factor model. And what you should find is that the systematic factors are the ones that are going to be priced, okay? And at least in the limit, the residuals should be unpriced. So this, of course, developed, there were, as a result of this, Mark worked on some of this literature, but lots of other people worked on how do we test the APT. And there were a set of really interesting papers. I think the first one was Chamberlain and Rothschild. Do you know if that's right, Mark? Yeah. Uh, who brought up this idea that you could use principal components analysis to figure out what these factors were, okay? And these were later, these same ideas were later exploited in Connor and Karachik, okay? Now, Chamberlain and Rothschild made some very strong claims. They said, um, this is from the abstract of their paper, um, uh, in an approximate APT setting, which was the setting they explored, the corresponding K eigenvectors converge and play the role of factor loadings. Hence, only a pr principal component analysis is necessary in empirical work, okay? So that's all we needed. Now, um, <laughs> there were some later, uh, uh, there were some issues with this, some of which Brian already talked about, okay? And they led to us pretty much until very recently abandoning this principal components analysis approach. Recently, it's seen a bit of a renaissance with the work that Brian's doing and Stefano, Giglio, and, and some others, okay? Uh, but for a while, there were some tests, again, you know, Steve with, uh, with Naifu and, and Dick. Uh, Dick did a, an economically motivated factor analysis, and then, of course, what's become the most popular sort of factor analysis more recently, uh, is based on the fact that we've got all these characteristics that forecast returns. So you basically build factor portfolios on the basis of these characteristics. And of course, the, the best known of that is, of those papers is the Fama French paper. But as we know, there are lots and lots of others, okay? So uh, quickly, what is principal components analysis? Brian explained this probably a lot better than I'm gonna explain it. But the basic idea is what you try and do is you minimize the sum of squared residuals across all assets, okay, and across all the times in your sample, okay? Now, um, the advantage to doing this in, you know, in the standard setting is you can do an eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition, okay? Just order the eigenvalues and then the, 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 the first few eigenvectors are going to be the, uh, the weights on Multiplying those weights by the returns give you your principal components, okay? Uh, the, there are some problems with this, okay? Again, as Brian mentioned, this is static. Those betas are invariant, so to the extent you have time variation in loadings, you're not gonna pick it up, okay?
Okay? And there's, of course, lots of evidence that, you know, think about an individual firm. Uh, sometimes it'll be value, sometimes it'll be growth, some, sometimes it'll be big, sometimes it'll be small, small. so there does tend to be lots of uh, uh, time variation, which is clearly not going to be captured here. It tends to be unstable. Turns out if you look at those eigenvalues, eigenvectors, if you estimate them in one period and then in another separate period, you'll see they're completely different. Okay? The interpretation is really tricky. Okay? If you look at the Connor Karachik, the first, few, the first eigenvector is usually pretty close to the market. That's cool. But beyond that, they're really hard to interpret. Okay? So um, this is part of what Chen Roll and Ross uh, was trying to address. One final thing, which didn't get mentioned here, but I want to I, I bring this up because it's, I think, actually really important. And to my knowledge, the first paper that talked about this was Margaret Bray. Uh, uh, but the idea was around before. One of the issues with this is this minimization, which is the effective solution of the problem, you're minimizing the sum of squared residuals across all assets. Okay? So in other words, what you're doing is you're weighting Apple's residual variance the same as you're weighting the smallest firm in the Russell 3000. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, the um, you know, you might want to say, well, we should have some weights here that more correspond to the economic magnitude associated with these, right? So one way you could think about this is, okay, well, what I could do is, if I could measure it, I can't, but if I could, I could break Apple up into, um, say, 5,000 firms. Because it turns out, if you look at the market cap of Apple relative to the, th the smallest firm in the Russell 3, the ratio is about 5,000 in terms of market cap. Okay? So break Apple up into 5,000 different groups. And, you know, if you could measure the returns on those, you could do a new PCA okay, that includes all the other stocks and then these 5,000 parts of Apple. Well, that's going to completely change the principal components that you get. So this is, this is the idea of repackaging, and this is something that you know, plays a big role in terms of thinking about what are the right kind of economic factors. Okay, um, let me come back to that in a bit. All right, so now what, what gets done in IPCA? Well, what we want to have is we want to have time variation in the betas, so we want to allow for that. How do we do that? Well, we'll follow kind of the standard procedure in econometrics. We'll pick a set of instruments, okay, a Z's, and these Z's we hope are going to capture the time variation in the loadings of the, uh, the assets on the different factors. So in other words, for each, each asset out there, for each stock, what we're going to do is we're going to have a set of variables that capture this. Okay? Um, once we do that, the, as Brian showed, this is the minimization problem. And it turns out this is something you can solve, so it's pretty cool. Now all we have to do is we estimate the gamma Bs. The gamma Bs are time invariant, but that's okay because the uh, underlying assumption here is that the, the time variation in the betas is going to be captured by the time variation in the instruments we're using. Okay? Here are, Brian showed you this. This is the last, I think, one of the last tables he showed there, table 10. There are a whole bunch of instruments here. Okay? This is the kitchen sink of stuff that we know forecast returns. Okay? Now, one thing I want to come back to this, I wanted to put this up because I think this is cool, but notice that these are all variables that forecast returns. They're not necessarily variables like industry makeup, things like this, that we think might explain the cross-section of realized returns. These tell you about the cross-section of predicted returns. Okay? And this is something that I think is a little bit of an issue. Okay? We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, Okay, now, the interpretation, five minutes, oh my god, okay. Uh, <laughs> the, um, how can we think about what's going on here? Well, with these instruments, they have a, this is, by the way, beautifully written, and it really helped me understand this. What IPCA is doing is, with this set of L instruments, you can think intuitively about this as doing standard PCA with a set of uh, managed L managed portfolios. In other words, just take the instruments, form portfolios where the weights in the portfolios are proportional to the different instruments. So for example, if book to price is one of your instruments, which it is, okay, then one of these X's is going to be you go long high book to market forms and firms and you go short low book to market firms, kind of just like HML. Okay? Um, then we do a PCA of that, okay, and that gives us our, uh, 
our, our set of factors. Okay. Now, there are a lot of claims here, and this is, a, this is again where I want to kind of throw this toy against the wall and see, see if it still continues to work. Okay. Um, the uh, Llewellyn Eagle Shankel and, and Sheridan and I wrote a couple papers that argued that there are some problems with a lot of tests that have been done in terms of the selection of test assets. Okay? The claim that's made here is that this gets around that problem. Okay? Um, uh, uh, IPCA provides a resolution for this dilemma. Now, I'm going to argue this is a little bit strong, so let me tell you exactly what I mean. Okay, so let, let me jump in and in the next three minutes, I guess, talk about where I think these tests might not have as much power as they could and how to resolve this. Okay, so this was the second test that Brian talked about, where what they do is they compare their uh, the, the first three principal components in their test to other proposed models like the Fama French five factor model, et cetera. Okay? So what are we doing here? Well, this is the this is the model setup. This is the this is the new term that's added, and basically these G's are the realizations of factor models like the Fama French five factor model. Okay? And the finding here is that the if you basically if you set the gamma delta to zero, it doesn't affect the fit of the model. In other words, the, um, uh, it, it doesn't help to explain things. Okay? I guess I'm thinking this isn't particularly surprising because this is kind of like asking, well, if you've got book to price over here, does adding in HML help you? Well, you've already got the managed portfolio with book to price, so you know, I'm not sure that's surprising. This is the one I do want to talk a little bit more about, though, which is the test, is the alpha zero? Okay, so, here, as, as Brian explained very, very well, what we're doing is we're adding in a term here. This is the, um, the unrestricted model. And basically what we want to do is compare the fit of the restricted and the unrestricted model. In other words, does it affect the fit of the model if you set gamma alpha equal to zero? Okay? Um, the finding is it doesn't. Okay? So the argument is, look, characteristics don't really help in explaining. Well, I, I think that's absolutely true. Okay? However, the other thing that I would like to see tested would be whether the factor loadings, whether you could remove those, the corresponding factor loadings, and that would help in terms of the predicted R squared. And my prediction is it wouldn't. Okay, so let me explain a bit more what I mean about that. I guess I have like one minute left? Yeah, I want to give you one and a half. Okay, one and a half, I got it. You're my student. <laughs> this is the way he treated me even then, too. Okay. The, um, okay, so when, it, when are you going to get a factor model and when are you going to get a characteristics model? Okay, so what Sheridan and I in our 97 paper, uh, what, I think the way our work often gets interpreted is we said, look, a characteristics model will explain the world, not a factor model. We actually didn't say that, okay? Um, we argue that a characteristics, the right characteristics model will explain the world when a wrong factor model doesn't. Okay? However, one of the things that we know is as long as there's no arbitrage, there does exist a factor model that works. Okay? Um, but a characteristics model also exists, I mean, kind of trivially. Okay? There is always going to be some set of variables that you can, with enough knowledge, that you could put together that would give you a perfect proxy for expected returns, okay? Um, the, um, you know, one other thing I want to emphasize is if you're trying to put an interpretation on this into, you know, is the world behavioral or rational? Well, it's awfully hard to do this. And, you know, there are a couple recent papers that discuss this, okay? So what we're really trying to do is figure out if we've got the right factor model, okay? Um, the, if you've got a wrong factor model, okay, then you can probably reject that. Well, I'm going to argue that the factor model that these guys have come up with okay, could actually be improved. How come? Well, again, it goes back to the set of instruments. So let me explain exactly what I mean. Okay? Um, basically, let's assume you've got a perfect set of characteristics. Okay? Uh, 30 seconds? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay and you form a portfolio based on those characteristics. This is one of the managed characteristic portfolios. Okay? Um, the, will that managed characteristic portfolio explain the cross-section of returns? It will not. And the reason is, this actually, there is a, um, 
shoot, the slide didn't work here, but basically you need a mean variance efficient portfolio to explain returns, and we know the equation for a mean variance efficient portfolio isn't that you weight the assets proportional to their expected returns, you weight it to sigma to the minus one times the expected returns, okay? So there needs to be a sigma to the minus one here. Now, um, the, okay, when you sort just on characteristics, it turns out you've got the problem that you're forming portfolios where the risk is not necessarily hedged. So what I'm arguing here is that what you need to do is you need to go in and introduce variables like industries or uh, other forecasts of risk that are completely unrelated to returns, okay? And that when you do this, uh, you'll be able to improve the factor model and explain the cross-section of returns better. Now, why, why do they do such a good job now explaining returns? Because they're projecting, for example, the alphas <laughs> onto this set of characteristics, okay, and not including these other instruments. All right, I'm way over time. Now you're minus, you're one minute. Okay. <laughs>